All right, Colleen, you're good to go. All right. Well, I'm excited to be here to talk about birds because that's my most favorite thing in the world. And one of the reasons I like them and admire them so much is their, their tenacity and resiliency. I mean, winter time is a hard time. I mean, and these birds don't have little heated houses the way we do um, to deal with cold months. I mean, they're out there in the elements. So today we're gonna talk about those birds. And here's a list of the birds that are commonly found around Litzinger during the winter months. Obviously, I'm not gonna talk about all of these birds, but I am gonna share characteristic, everything that they have in common. And also there's a couple that have unique adaptations. Um, so these are the different ways birds cope with the winter months. Um, migration, change in diet, caching food, flocking, roosting, and other physical adaptations. And the biggest one is migration. A lot of the birds go from, you know, when the months get cold, they hightail it to a warmer, warmer place. Um, they, you know, go all the way from Canada down to South America. And usually those are the birds that don't change their diets. Um, warblers, vireos, some shorebirds, hummingbirds. Those are the birds that commonly go down to a, a warmer climate. Then there's the short distant migrants um, where they simply go from one state to another. Maybe they just say, go from Missouri to Texas, go towards a little warmer. House wrens are pretty common about that. They, they'll go from one state to another. And then some simply go from an upper elevation to a lower elevation, like dark-eyed juncos. And then there's others who simply go from one habitat to another, like robins. You know, a lot of people say they don't see robins in the wintertime, that they, they must not be here. Well, that's not the case. You know, during the spring and summer, we'll see them in our um, neighborhoods. We'll see them in the backyards and the parks. And then wintertime, they're not around. Well, simply what they do is they go to a rural area they'll go you know from the city to the to the, the country so to speak they'll you know they hit the woodland areas and there are those birds that switch their diet um, they may simply add seed to their diets um, some will completely switch from seed from insects to seeds um, so like for an example, song sparrows will go from insects to a seed diet. They'll eat flower seeds or whatever they can find. Um, then there's birds like the woodpeckers, the cardinals. Well, they'll actually add seeds and insects in addition to the insects. And then there are all those birds like cedar waxwings that don't change their diet at all. Um, cedar waxwings are frugivores. All they do is eat fruit. And let me double back and say that bluebirds, while they eat insects, they'll also add fruit to their diet. Uh, and in that case, so bluebirds and the frugivores, they just can't break down seed in their body. They won't get the nutrients from that. Okay. And then there are the birds that follow the food. Um, these are mostly known as eruptive species. So you'll have like your pine siskins and your crossbills. They may migrate south for the winter, but um, if they have, there's a bad pine cone crop one year, say, then they'll follow the food. They'll go a little bit further south from their wintering range to follow the food. Like pine siskins this year, um, I know in the fall, we all have had a big population of them. There were tons of them at Litzinger and I've never had pine siskins in my backyard and this year I had pine siskins. I'm not sure they're still around, they might be. Um, I have seen a couple at Litzinger, but I think a more drastic example of an eruptive species are the crossbills. As you can see on the map, I don't know if you can see my pointer, so the pale blue indicates that's like, oh no, there we go. Um, the, the pale blue indicates that that's, they're not as commonly found, that, that that's pretty far south of their uh, winter range. And so I know this year there were white winged crossbills found in Missouri. I just don't know if they were found in St. Louis or not. But basically these two birds rely heavily on pine cone seeds. And if that crop is bad, that's the only time they'll 
will move and follow the food. All right. So coping strategies, the I think the fat storage is shivering and maybe to some extent the fluffing kind of all go hand in hand. So with fat storage, whether it be for migration or surviving a cold winter night, birds will just eat all day and increase their body weight and then they lose it overnight. Like an American goldfinch will gain 15% of its body weight in one day, but then lose it overnight. Tufted titmice have been found to gain two grams and lose it overnight. And shivering is plays a big part of that. I mean, obviously it takes energy to shiver. And I'm not sure how much energy fluffing entails, um, but basically when the bird fluffs its feathers, those the down feathers are kind of exposed, will will trap the heat that's closest, the air, I'm sorry, the air that's closest to their body and heat it up. Like a bird's temperature can range anywhere from 102 to 109 degrees, that's normal. So then that air that's around their body will heat up to that temperature and help them stay warm. Okay, let's see, do I need to go? Okay, then there's nocturnal hypothermia where a bird will actually drop their temperature to conserve energy. And then here's an example of some of the birds that really drop their temperature low. I mean, I think chickadees especially are pretty drastic with their temperature drop and you know, cardinals and, and downy woodpeckers. So then there's food caching. Food caching is, you know, storing food in different places. And these are the bird families that will store their food. Other, not all species will do this or not all bird families will do this. And so corvids, the crows and the jays will actually start storing their food in August through November when the temperatures are warm and the food is abundant and they're not just trying to survive. So basically when the sun is out and the roof, the roof needs fixing, you fix it when the sun's out and not when, the, well, not when it's raining, that kind of thing. So blue jays will store their food singly in small or in tiny batches. So you know, they'll store it you know, in between a bark crevice. They'll even store it on the ground and put soil over it. And I know this from personal experience because during the winter I will feed peanuts. I'll provide peanuts for the birds. And during the spring and summer when I'm gardening, pulling weeds, you know, planting stuff, I'll find peanut shells or even peanuts with a loose layer of soil over the top. Um, so owls, I'm not sure all owls store their food. I know great horned owls do and saw what owls do. I, I can't attest to any of the others, but great horned owls, when they store their food, they'll actually eat a part of it and then stash it some, you know, in a, in a tree. And of course, you know, with cold weather, everything freezes. And so they've got this chunk of icy meat. What do they do? They sit on it, they incubate it and warm it up before they eat it, which I thought was kind of interesting. Woodpeckers, not all woodpeckers store food. Um, we know that acorn woodpeckers out west store their food, but here locally, red-bellied woodpeckers always store their food and downies only occasionally store their food. Nuthatches, the male and females will store it in different ways. The males actually will store towards the top, to the mid to the top of a tree and you know, in the bark crevices and the female will actually store her food down closer to the ground of the tree. And then chickadees and titmice, um, there they both are examples of they're storing it a little bit here and a little bit there. But what's interesting about them is that they'll go up to 330 feet away from that food source to store their food. They'll kind of go outside of their feeding territory. Um, and also dominant birds will often store their food, usually like adults, and then the juveniles um, or their, you know, the lesser subordinates will actually try and pilfer that food. So if you think about it, it's kind of like the adults got the Oreos and they're trying to store, hide the Oreos from their kids. So these birds have to, oh my gosh, there's a blue jay outside my window right now talking to me. <laughs> anyway, so he's, you know, chiming in. Okay, anyway. Um, so how do, how do the birds deal with thieves and how do they remember? 
Um, so in those families that we, I pointed out earlier, their hippocampus, you know, the part of the brain that's responsible for memory is actually larger than in other families that don't store food. And then like there's been studies that have watched or believe that tufted titmice can remember their, their, the place where they stored their food for a week, weeks, possibly even months after they stored it. Chickadees have been found to look at the food they just stored for a moment or two before moving on, like they're trying to remember where they're putting the food. And then there's scatter hoarders and larder hoarders. The scatter ones, like I mentioned before, are blue jays where they, you know, put a seed here, a seed there. Um, they don't put it all together like a larder hoarder would be, but they would just have one, one central spot where they store their food. Um, Red-bellied woodpeckers do this. Um, great horned owls do that too, where they just have a one central place. Um, and like I mentioned with dealing with thieves, I mean, some birds will go outside their territory. Um, Red-bellied woodpeckers apparently are very, um, can get kind of violent when they, when they, they all say they'll vigorously defend their foods, their food stash. Um, yeah. So that was, that was quite interesting when I read about red-bellied woodpeckers being kind of violent. And then birds feed in flocks. Um, they're same, same species flocks, like this ginormous group of grackles I got one winter that descended into my yard to feed. Um, there's also um, cardinals will do that too. And with cardinals, what's interesting is you know how territorial cardinals are. Um, what they'll do is they'll actually start a small flock like November or so, the number, the total will peak in December or January, and then the flock gradually decreases in size come February, March when it's breeding time. Um, and they'll go, like a flock will be like five to 20 birds. Um, and so it's also been found that as when it gets colder, there's more cardinals that are together. So another one uh, uh, that's kind of interesting are, are Eastern bluebirds. So there will be a mated pair, a male, a female, and they'll have two to three juvenile bluebirds with them. But those bluebirds are from are not their own. They're somebody else's kids, essentially. So there's just that, that little sort of family unit together for the winter. And then there's also mixed flocks. Oops. So there's mixed flocks. And I think everyone's familiar with the mixed feeding flocks. Like you'll have cardinals, chickadees, and you'll have white-throated sparrows, maybe even a downy woodpecker. And they will actually separate themselves into the different types of seed they eat. So the bigger birds with the bigger, thicker beaks can will focus on those, um, that food or those seeds that are stronger and thicker while the, the smaller birds with the smaller or softer beaks tend to go for the smaller bird seed or type, you know, seed type food. And roosting, roosting is another coping, a coping mechanism of the birds during the winter. Oh, Colleen? Yep. We got a question before you leave the flock situation. Uh, we got a couple questions in the chat, but one of them I think I'll leave to the end because we haven't gotten anything about uh, uh, you know, attracting them to uh, houses yet. But the one that just came in is what is the advantage to birds when they flock? Oh, good, good question. Uh, the main advantage I think is they're looking for danger. You'll have more sets of eyes looking for danger versus just one or two individual birds. So more birds can focus on eating. Um, like I read one thing where downy woodpeckers, if they're in a flock, they won't even look for danger. They'll just eat. Whereas if they're by themselves, they're gonna like look half the time, eat half the time. So that's the advantage. You say there's another question or you were gonna, cause I will talk about actually how to attract birds and how to help them here towards the end. Okay, yeah, I'll just save the uh, house question for whenever you get to a section about that. Okay. Okay, and then, so roosting is another coping mechanism. Obviously you have a bunch of birds together, they're gonna stay warm. Um, we've all seen the blackbirds, you know, there'll be hundreds, if not thousands of starlings and red-winged blackbirds and those type of birds. 
that roost together. But there are birds that, no that normally do not roost together, but will do so on a cold night. And like the example I have here um, of the bluebirds, they're all together. Normally they don't roost at night on a winter night, but if it's really cold, they will get together and snuggle in um, either a nest box or a tree. And as you can see in the picture, they, they kind of arrange themselves so that no one is, is smothered where they all have a chance to breathe and to move around. Oh, so, and then cardinals also will roost together, but very rarely. <clears throat> That'll be maybe two or three cardinals together. Otherwise, I don't think there's a lot of birds that roost together at night. And the woodpeckers. So this is a picture of something that happened. And I know James can probably attest to this. When I was mist netting, this fall, this was probably mid to late October. We, what we usually do is we have the nets out in the prairie and then when we wait between net runs, we would wait on the patio. Well, for like a week, there was this pileated woodpecker that would go to the sycamore tree and he was making a cavity. I mean, he was really going to town and I was like, well, he can't be making a nesting cavity, it's October. And so I went home and I read about it and the woodpeckers will make their own winter cavities. The winter cavities are smaller. They have a smaller entrance. They're more, you know, they're not as room, roomy being a relative term, not as roomy. And they will actually face away from prevailing winds. Downy woodpeckers will make multiple winter cavities, you know, in case one is lost in a storm or, you know, there's an animal or another bird that takes over one of those cavities. Okay, and physical adaptations, I gotta, let's see. Um, so barbed feathers, that, I don't know if you can tell the, the barbs on these feathers, the downy feathers, um, they have little barbs and those barbs will actually trap the air. And that's what kind of pulls it into the body. And then the counter current circulation, this one, I, I took me a, a, a minute to kind of understand what was going on. So basically, you know, you see a gull standing on frozen water or you see a duck in water and the temperature outside is 35 degrees. It's like, how does that bird not get hypothermia or a frostbite? So that is the major veins and arteries in the leg split into tinier blood vessels. So you can see where the, um, the arteries and the veins are kind of intermingling. And that allows for the heat to transfer the warm blood going to the, like it goes down. And then as the colder blood is coming up, it intermingles with that warmer blood and that warms it up. And that I think helps them from getting hypothermia or frostbite, if that makes sense. Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. All right. So how can you is that is that is that feature um, uh, common across many species or all species? All species. Thank all you. the birds have that adaptation. And what all is right. what is that called? What is it called? Oh, it's called um, hold on, counter current circulation. Okay, so how can you help? Feed like a boss. And boss being black oil sunflower seed, that's my personal, I was trying to be funny. Anyway, so you can um, feed the birds, basically. The calories and supplemental foods, especially those that have high, from high in fat and protein, will allow birds to emerge from winter in better condition than those birds that are just relying on their surroundings for food. Um, for example, a single peanut can supply one third of a Carolina wren's metabolic needs for the day. And bir the, uh, birds that go to bird feeders have a higher sur winter survival rate versus those birds that rely on their surroundings like 30% higher. And then the supplemental feeding also means earlier nesting times and bigger clutches the following spring. So they'll have a healthier, at least the first clutch, they'll have a healthier set of offspring and there's different seeds and things that you that you can use to, that will attract birds like this uh, black oil sunflower seed that's the seed that gives you the biggest bang for your buck it's got a lot of it's high in fat high in protein 
and it's got a thin shell, which means that all birds can access it. Um, there's, um, there's also like stripes, striped sunflower seed and not all birds can crack that shell like blue jays and cardinals can, but with, with the black oil sunflower seed, everybody can eat it. And then if you wanna attract like dark eyed juncos and sparrows, you wanna feed millet. Millet's an, another good one to add into a mix. And then down here, this is thistle or also known as niger. And um, you'll get morning doves and goldfinches and, and um, pine siskins love thistle. And then like I mentioned, the peanuts. Um, so you, if, you're, if you wanna get like really helpful, you can either get them in the shell or you can get them where they're not in the shell. And the, the ones that'll go for the ones in the shell are like your woodpeckers, your blue jays, and I think sometimes Carolina wrens, I've seen titmice go for those. And then of course, everybody, will, not everybody, but anybody who eats peanuts will eat the sh peanuts that are out of the shell, like chickadees, titmice, Carolina wrens will eat those. And then there's suet. Suet is basically, um, Rendered suet is a process that involves melting, cooking, and straining out impurities so that the finished product is less prone to melting and spoiling. Um, so it's lard, basically. You've got animal fat and all that gross stuff that makes up suet. And manufacturers will put in seed, peanuts, etc. cetera. Um, so the suet cake, which is right here on the left, it's, um, that's better to use in winter because the melting point is at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, though I really personally contest that because I've had it, I've mistakenly fed it during the summer in 90 degree, degree weather and it gets really gross. But as you can see, it's kind of has an oily consistency to it, whereas the su suet dough kind of has a crumbly feel and its melting point is at 150 degrees. So that's what, if you're going to feed suet during the summer, that's what you want to feed. And then there's different types of feeders. Um, so there's this one is a hopper feeder. Can you see the arrow or is that just on my screen? We can see it. Okay. Okay, so this is a hopper feeder. Hopper feeders usually have bigger perches and easier access to the food. So your bigger birds like blue jays and cardinals will easily perch on a hopper feeder. And if you don't mind feeding everybody in the neighborhood, which meaning squirrels, possums, raccoons, et cetera, you can put up a platform feeder. Well, all birds will go to it. Whoops. Anyway, okay, so then the suet, there's two types of suet things. There's this, you know, there's basically a suet cage. And then over here, that's the upside. Oh, it's gonna be the problem, isn't it? There we go. The upside down feeders, like if you have problems with starlings, or house sparrows, you put, you get one of those because they don't have the leg muscles set up that say a woodpecker or a titmouse has where they can feed upside down. And then the thing that all the goldfinches are in, are on, that's a, that's a thistle feeder. And you got to be careful when you look, when you look at, when you look for a thistle feeder versus a, a tube feeder. Um, the thistle feeder has smaller feeding ports, so only thistle will come out so if you put a bigger seed in there, nothing's going to come out because it's too small for the seed to leave. And then the thing the Blue Jays on, that's a peanut, that's a peanut feeder. There's also like peanut wreaths. And then to the right of the Blue Jay, that's a tube feeder. Now tube feeders are mostly for smaller birds because it has a smaller perch and it's not, it can get awkward for bigger birds to get on. So like chickadees and tip mice are fine with, with, um, the tube feeders, whereas woodpeckers and blue jays and stuff are not. So other ways you can help the birds during the winter, if you're not crazy about feeding, you can um, provide water. Water, you're going to get species, you'll attract species that you normally wouldn't with water. Like, you know, those birds that aren't attracted to feeders will be still attracted to water. Now with water, obviously, if it's cold, the water's going to freeze. So you want to either buy an immersion heater like um, that you can put in the, the um, bath, bird bath, or and then some of them actually will have built in heaters. And with water, you want to make sure it's no more than two inches deep. They like shallow. It's easier for them to drink with 
if the water is shallow. And if you have a deeper bath, you can just put rocks or something in it to kind of help, you know, where they can jump on a rock and then and, and drink. And another thing is a brush pile. Um, you know, obviously the leaves on our trees and shrubs are gone. So the birds don't have protection from the elements, but also they don't have a place to hide if there's a predator. And a brush pile will give them a place to hide. And also they're, you know, with, you know, if you put a bunch of dead branches and things, there might be, there may even be insects in the, under the bark. And so that may actually provide another food source for the birds. And gardening for the birds. We're all native, native plant lovers. And this is one of the advantages to having native plants is in the fall and winter, there's, there's seed right there and the birds won't have to work as hard if you put native plants in the yard. And then when I say that, be sure not to um, cut the, he the heads off or cut the plants down because then they're not really gonna have a, a food source. So just leave everything as is and let them eat. And they're, I mean, and I'm gonna provide a handout. I mean, I did some digging around and I can also personally attest to some of this that basically anything in the Astor family, the birds are gonna go to. Um, for example, like in my yard, I have gray, gray headed coneflower, purple coneflower, sweet coneflower, and the goldfinches go nuts and all of that. And they'll actually go to the, to that first before they'll go to the feeders. And of course there's others, there's grasses and other flowers. And, you know, for our birds that eat um, fruit, you want to have your dogwoods, viburnums, spice bush and other types of shrubs that have berries because they they're they need the help too. And of course there are winter citizen science projects you can participate in. Um, there's uh, Cornell has a project feeder watch where from November through April, I think now they extended it to April, you actually sit and you watch your bird feeders, you watch your backyard and you count the birds for two, like two days, you can pick how long you choose to watch, um, as long as it's 20 minutes, I think. Um, it does cost, if you're a member of Cornell, it's $15, and if you're a non-member, it's $18. But you also get um, some posters and you get access, a digital access to their magazine, which is pretty nice. It's a good magazine. And then upcoming is the Great Backyard Bird Count. And this year it's February 12th through the 15th. It's free and you can go anywhere you want as long as, you know, a park, your backyard. Um, and as long as you watch, you gotta watch a minimum of 15 minutes, but you record all the birds you see and hear. And then you can either put an eBird or you can put it on uh, Cornell's website. All right. Any questions? Actually, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. How do I do that? Uh, Should be down on the bottom. Can can we ask a verbal question too? Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, um, is the uh, the commercial feed that you buy at say like? Walmart or, or Sam's or something like that, is that varied and nutritious enough or should you buy special feed? Well, like for me, I just feed black oil sunflower seed. Um, the, the seed that you see like at the hardware store or Walmart, it's got a bunch of fillers, basically different little grains and the birds aren't going to eat that. They're just going to toss it. So you're wasting your, I mean, personally, I think you're wasting your money. It's better to go with black oil sunflower seed or you know, that, you know, anything a mix with like the different sunflower seeds is good. Safflower seed. And which did you say was the thin shelled? Uh, black oil sunflower seed. And the, and the chickadees and the wrens can eat that? Because that's what we have mostly in our yard. Yes, you will. Yeah, they will eat that. And cardinals and two and also? Cardinals and I mean, I got red-bellied woodpeckers, um, tufted titmice, chickadees, cardinals, all come to the black my black oil sunflower feeders. Has anybody noticed that there are fewer birds so far this this winter? It seems that I have quite a 
this is going to say backwards, but there are a lot less birds so far around my feeder than I recall from previous years. On the contrary, we have, we have, we must have five times as many birds. John goes out and refills the feeders three times a day. I mean, they empty every single one. We have never had such an invasion of birds. It's incredible. Nancy's wow. stealing Just all your birds. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're gonna have to go over to Nancy's house and leave like a trail of seeds back to your house. Right. Right. I will say that for me, juncos. I've lost my juncos over the years. They've they've gradually now. Like before, I would have dozens of them, and now I'm lucky if I get six in my yard. Yeah, that's I've noticed that at Litzing too, actually, that there aren't as many juncos as there have been in previous years. And someone was asking about feeding in the warmer months. I would say no. Um, you, especially with breeding birds, they they may get kind of lazy and feed their chicks um, seed. And breed, young growing birds need that need insects need that protein from insects. And so it's better for the birds overall for their health if you don't feed during the warm winter months. So what month to start and what month to stop with your feeders would you recommend? Yeah, I do November through March is what is basically when I feed, will feed the birds. Basically when it stops getting, um, when, when it starts to get warmer and warmer, then I'll stop. Elaine, what's your opinion on the sunflower hearts and mealworms? Oh, well, those are good. Those are definitely, the sunflower hearts, the only disadvantage to those is that they are prone to spoiling. You know, if you get, if they get wet for a long period of time, they're going to, they're going to start getting moldy. Because that's, <laughs> that's what, that, well, that's what I use. And yeah, you probably get all kinds of birds too. And I put them in, I have a flat feeder down on the ground for the morning doves because they can't come to a feeder because they're too big. So yeah. you had mentioned um, using thistle for the doves. Oh, they love thistle. They but love doesn't it. that get lost in a ground feeder? Because my ground feeder has pretty big holes. Yeah, it probably would. Like what I do is I'll throw it on the ground and then they'll I'll go to it. And it's amazing. It's like, cause I'll throw thistle into my, into the grass. And it's like, how do they find it? But they, they find it. I see them eating it. Okay. Uh, where do birds sleep? Um, they, like some will sleep in shrubs. Some will sleep in trees. Um, they can go anywhere from three to 10 miles away from their food source to sleep. Um, other than cats, the Biggest pre with predators, I would say, I would say Cooper's hawks and Sharpshin hawks. I don't know that for sure, but those are, um, those two hawks eat nothing but birds. Um, I mean, I would, I would say birds are probably their biggest, could be their biggest threats. And well, how do you feed the ground feeding birds when you have so many squirrels? Oh, <laughs> you, <don't. laughs> you just gotta suck it up. Suck it up. Yeah, <laughs> I hate to say that. I mean, what you could do is feed thistle. They don't like the taste of oh, thistle. Okay. Not thistle, um, safflower seed. Um, they don't like that taste, but not all birds will eat it. So it's Sorry, just say that again. Which uh, safflower seed? Safflower. Okay. Yeah, they don't like the taste of safflower seed. Okay. But you won't get all birds that eat it either. It's an acquired taste, I think. Right. Well, I, I love get the morning dove, so I want to either uh, OK Hatchery or from um, Wild Birds Unlimited, and I get the uh, the suet feeders that have the red pepper. And that keeps the squirrels away. Right. Yeah, I got that too. But I was thinking about the morning doves that are on the ground and stuff. 
I'm not sure they'll eat safflower seed. They've got a really soft beak. And I think that's why they like like the sunflower seed, the thistle, and the millet, because they have an easier time cracking the shell or swallowing it whole. Oh, and they're also fruit eaters too. And clean feeders, yes, it is very important to clean feeders. Um, the, so there's something known as conjunctivitis that birds can get, it's basically pink eye. It's mostly house finches, but gold finches get it too. And that's, um, it's, it's, it's spreads pretty rapidly. And so it's, I would say clean your feeder. I clean mine. I'm kind of bad about it. I clean mine every three months. I'm, but I'm wondering, it may not hurt to uh, feed it or um, clean it more than that. What does that mean, clean it? Um, you clean it with a one to 10 bleach solution. Say that again, please. You clean it with a one to 10 bleach solution. Oh, actually wash it out to yep. clean it. Yep. Yeah, like like what I'll do is I'll have a bucket with my solution. And I'll have like oh either a you know a dish rag or a sponge, and I'll clean it, and then I'll take the hose and hose it out. Because you want to be sure to you know get remove all the the bleach residue out. Do you what about bird houses? When do you clean those? I'm always afraid to you know do it because I don't want to disturb something. More, I would say February. You can clean them out February. I mean, because they will, like, birds will use those to roost in during cold nights, like bluebirds, Eurasian tree sparrows do. What, I don't know, well, I'm not, not sure about woodpeckers, but. And do squirrels need the seeds to increase their survival rate? I don't know. I can't imagine that those little seeds would, I mean, they would have to eat a ton of seeds for it I, to make a difference. I can't imagine they'd need any help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so uh, Jack had a question about uh, attracting screech owls uh, to a box house. Uh, do you have experience with that, or is anybody else in the area in this uh, call have experience with that? And it says, uh, when do you open it up to avoid attracting squirrel nests? That's a little out of my realm of experience, um, to be honest with you. I, I don't know. I mean, I know there are nest boxes for screech owls, um, but. We, we had a screech owl box in our front yard for a couple of years and we attracted them. We had a pair, we had them mating and then they vanished. I mean, it was, we had the whole neighborhood. We had, we'd set up our scope across the way and all the kids in the neighborhood were, you know, they'd tell us when the, the birds, one would be in the house and one would be uh, would come by and call about dusk, and so the, all the neighborhood kids would be across the street waiting for them to come. The little boy uh -huh. next door could say, "Out, oh, they're out." It was fabulous. But then they left us and they went to a hollow tree down the street. So they rejected our beautiful bird house. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the experience was amazing, and I, you know, I think if you build one, they will come. Whether they'll stay or not is something else. I that would say. Our... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm done. Oh, um, get on the Missouri Department of Conservation's website and then, you know, maybe type that in the search engine. There might be some suggestions they have. And that's true. Audubon does have um, beginner bird walks. Um, so that that's an option, too, for people. And then is bleach look, um, you know, birdhouses are kind of hard to clean. I've never actually used anything. I just pull the nest out. Um, that would be a question you could ask, say, like at Wild Birds Unlimited, because I know they sell nest boxes or even the Missouri Department of Conservation. But personally, I don't, other than just pulling the nest out. Yeah, I mean, with most birdhouses being wood, um, unless it's got like, unless it's painted, you know, like some kind of like decorative birdhouse. I would assume that probably bleach, you know, putting bleach on the wood, the wood would be able to absorb that. Uh, for a disinfectant, you could probably use rubbing alcohol because that's going to dissipate. But I'm sure there, I'm sure there's probably plenty of information on, on that online. Yeah. And then, um, so also back higher up in the uh, chat was 
talking about shelled black sunflower seed is more expensive, but it avoids the mess. Uh, any any comments on that? Yes. Um, so it is more expensive. You're right. But when you buy stuff at Walmart that has the filler seed, if you look, there's hardly any black oil sunflower seed. There's a lot more of that millet and the little Milo and the birds don't eat it. They just throw it out. So, I mean, they're not this eating a lot, you know, it's cheaper, but in the end, they're not really eating as much. They're just more throwing it out. Yeah, Colleen, this, like is, this is Jack. I, uh, I found that uh, Menards now carries shelled uh, black oil seed for half the price of Wild Birds Unlimited. Yeah, what I get my seed at the hardware store. Like I used to work for Wild Birds Unlimited <laughs> and they were expensive. I mean, even for us, we didn't get much of a discount. But I mean, Menards, the hardware store, anywhere that has black oil sunflower seed, it's just, it's just as good. Yeah. Ace Hardware is pretty good too. Yeah. You got to think that since their only market is you know, bird feeding and bird houses, all this, you know, anything focused towards birds, they're getting a lot less traffic in their stores. So they're probably going to have to mark up their prices quite a bit. Whereas a hardware stores, you know, they don't have to jack up their prices to get customers in the store. <laughs> Do they have expiration dates on these bags? I was always curious because that's why I would go someplace more expensive thinking, yeah. you know, it's going to be fresher and, and I don't know. That's true. I mean, that, that is, I think an advantage because they have climate controlled storage places. I let the birds tell me, like if I put out seed and then they just suddenly don't eat it, I'm like, well, I need to get more seed, you know? Right. Yeah, so I have I the same. I have the same problem with uh, Niger seed. It seems to be uh, goldfinches seem to be very particular about the freshness of the seed. Yeah. If it's at all bad or it's been through a couple of rainstorms or something like that, you might as well put it on the ground because uh, it's. <laughs> yeah, it does um, does spoil easy easy easier than other seed, I think. And we got two questions I feel that are closely related to each other. <clears throat> How was the bird count at LREC this year? And then farther to a newer question here, uh, rarest bird sighted at LREC? So how okay. was the counts? And then what's the rarest bird? That's funny you mentioned it because I've actually been like, calculating last year and this year's differences. And it's almost, it's so weird. It's like there is no significant difference between both years. Um, and the rare, the, so like recently there were rusty blackbirds at Litzinger. I was really excited about that. Um, and actually I've heard them the last two weeks I was there. I heard one or two, but I haven't seen them, but there was one day there was a flock of 11 of them. And then I caught a bay breasted warbler. Um, during my fall migration, which was, I was really excited about that. That was a first for the site. So, anytime we get any kind of warbler like that, that's just, that's great. Because warblers are particular about their habitat. And then had a comment about the Audubon Society has frequent bird ID trips in the St. Louis area. And I'm assuming they're talking about uh, the thing we skipped over. Yeah, just the, uh, well, I'm assuming like Riverlands, Audubon at Riverlands has a probably all kind of stuff for that. The, Webster, I mean, this the Webster Gross Nature Study Society has a has a bird group once a week too. Yeah. And the St. Louis Audubon, if you go online, um, has this trip schedule too. Uh, uh, still going on even though COVID. I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I, I think both Webster as well as Audubon have uh, suspended theirs uh, with COVID. Yeah, I know um, Webster has. Okay, two dead bar dolls within 100 feet of each other in February in two of the last five years. Okay, so with that, that could be a number of things with the bar dolls. Um, as you said, I found two dead bar dolls within 100 feet of each other in February in two of the last five years. So the potential cause there could be poisoning. Um, you know, people have um, 
have rat, the, those poison rat traps where the, the rat eats the poison but survives and it, you know, it goes back out in, into the habitats and it doesn't die right away. So if an, if an owl or a hawk eats that, they're poisoned and then they're gonna die. Another thing could be, if it's in February, it could be their starvation. Um, young birds uh, have a pretty high mortality rate their first year. It's like 80%. I mean, you know, it could be a young bird that died, just didn't quite get the hang of, hunt, hang of hunting and he just couldn't feed himself. Um, also, it could have had a, a skirmish with another predator. So, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons and it. You know, a lot of them also get hit by cars. Maybe it didn't, you know, sometimes they'll get hit and they don't, they survive the initial impact. Maybe they're able to fly away and then, you know, to die later. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could happen. I want to say something about the irony of people bringing their cats to a bird session. <laughs> The cats yes, are indoors. Yeah. I love indoor cats. I have a cat. Oh. <laughs> um, I have a cat too, but she's not in here because. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Hey. Hey. You can so be. So, are there are there the any cat. are there any bird uh, uh, bird watching? Um, excursions going on now that you know of at Shaw or anywhere due to COVID? I don't know. I don't, uh, yeah, think, I don't know. Just because of them still being underneath the Missouri Botanical Garden umbrella, I don't think Shaw is doing anything like that. Um, but Riverlands uh, or Audubon at Riverlands is they could potentially be having some classes there or maybe even Forest Park Forever uh, small groups. So you may want to check with their websites if they have any kind of birding thing going on. Well, oh, looks like there's some more things popping up. Um, Hello. Bows for birds put on by Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. Uh, it's a do it on your own that Aaron uh, put in. Uh, so to check. Yeah. Okay. It just means you go, you go into their website and you can print out the information and it's just something you do on your own. You're not doing it with a group. Um, there's 12 different parks in the St. Louis area and they have um, instructions of where you're going to look for this huge gold bow. Like you can't miss it. It's always on a paved trail. And then there's a little uh, print up giving a description of a bird, but it doesn't tell you what kind of bird it is. You've got to figure it out. And it's um, hidden somewhere near that bow. And it's a little wooden bird that someone has painted. It's a lot of fun. I like it. Oh. But I'm a bird nerd. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. All right. And wonder if the Eagle Watch will happen. I'm assuming probably like the stuff in Alton. Uh, I haven't, I haven't seen a bunch of advertising this year. I'm assuming that they're probably trying to deter people from grouping up and going and viewing the Eagles this year. I would check World Bird Sanctuary's website. I mean, they're usually a part of the Eagle Days, and so is Missouri Department of Conservation. So those are two places you could search. Uh, will Colleen's presentation be on YouTube, Colleen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Pam says Riverlands is having programs on weekends about hawks and eagles. Oh, yeah. What are hawks? I mean, do they eat any of this seed? No. No, they're strictly <laughs> meat eaters. How can I attract them to my yard to eat the squirrels? Oh, if I had the answer, I would tell you because I have that problem. <laughs> I had one in a tree this morning and I was like, I hope he sees the squirrels. You know, it's like. I had, a, I had a friend recently tell me that he had barred owls in his yard and he goes, they got a squirrel. They got a squirrel out of my yard. And I was like, send that bird over to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I almost start to wonder if squirrels just don't taste that good. 
you'd think with like the population of squirrels around that there'd be like just tons of hawks and owls around. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, can I tell you a hawk squirrel story? There. It's like you know. Go ahead, Nancy. Uh, we we have the same issue with millions of squirrels, and we try to trap squirrels. But we had a uh, a Cooper's hawk sitting on the back fence or no, sitting in a holly tree and there's a fence right underneath it. And this squirrel came along the top of the fence and we thought, aha, but we watched the squirrel go all the way across the top of the fence. The hawk ignored it and was looking at the birds. So we figured maybe <laughs> the squirrel was too big. I don't know, but this stupid squirrel, we thought, you know, he was un unfazed. And so we thought, oh, was, you know, I mean, I've seen the hawks, they've taken, I've seen them take birds off the feeder and take them off and, and eat them, but I've never seen them take a squirrel. <laughs> That's I, a true story. <laughs> I hear more yep. about owls taking squirrels, and I know the squirrels yeah. singers start freaking out when the owls are out and about. As they should. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the hawks uh, just aren't eyeing up the squirrels as much. Thanks, Dean. Any cultures that revere squirrels? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard that before. I can't say I'd be one in, among one of those. <laughs> no. All right. Well, if that is all the questions, we're at an hour. Oh, man. Yeah. I just want to say that the, the, the uh, calendar is awesome. Um, yes. And Adam, you're very photogenic. <laughs> And my face is. with Mary, of course, had to be Mary. So you see, I got my copy <laughs> right behind me. I just want to say it was not my idea to put myself in the calendar. That was that was Jane doing. It, Jane, we're, so we were all given months, and uh, we got to pick. What, how many, Leslie? Did we pick five from each month? I think four. Yeah, cool. it was a little daunting. I was like, I can't go through all of these fantastic photos. So I I assigned everybody months and um, let them pick four photos. And then I kind of went through and, you know, laid out the final photos. But it turned out really, really wonderfully. I mean, Rich takes just beautiful pictures. Yeah. Okay. He really and does. if you haven't gotten a calendar, let us know. Uh, Martha can send you one or you can stop by and pick it up. It is really a beautiful, beautiful Santa calendar. Send this. Santa, I don't know how to send it. Maybe, maybe next year I can get a picture of the bald eagle and have it in the calendar. Oh, yeah. I would like to say thank you so much for all the effort it takes to keep us connected and have these <laughs> enrichments. And I, I appreciate it a lot. Um, it's hard to be separate from the land and the people and the, and yeah. so thank you so much. And I will like to say, Adam, that I now notice mosses much more than I did before. Yes. They are, <laughs> I remember taking a class about bryophytes when I was in college. Uh, that was before the dinosaurs were extinct, but um, <laughs> I that was wonderful and thank you, Colleen. I learned a lot this morning. Thank, thank yeah, you. me too. I'm gonna clean it out of that. that. This was great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank, thank you, you guys. All. Good to see everybody. Yeah, it was good seeing you guys. Hey, Leslie. Yes, Jay. You know, um, something. Th this is great with the birds, but. <laughs> about all the other creatures that uh, winter there. Maybe one on the small rodents and mammals and stuff. Maybe one on squirrels. <gasps> uh, even, even on squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's uh, the capacity of what we can teach is, you know, by the people that we have involved. Unfortunately, I do not know of any squirrel specialists in St. Louis. If, anyone, yeah, if you know a squirrel person, if anybody knows of a squirrel specialist, please let me know. Or has or has squirrel recipes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yum. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.